Hello everyone and welcome to video 3 of this introductory lecture to fossils in sedimentary rocks and fossils. So we've looked at already the history of paleontology and um, what paleontology is, what fossils are, and some of the biology you need to know. Now we're going to finish by looking at fossil preservation or the field of taphonomy. So we've already covered the fact that fossils will typically represent just the hard parts of an animal. Um, that's not universally true in um, sites of exceptional preservation, say. Um, we can preserve soft parts and we'll be looking at those in just a bit. Um, and the fact that only hard parts are preserved can introduce biases into the fossil record. Uh, so what do we actually mean by hard parts? Well, actually hard parts depend on the group that we're talking about. Examples are the shells of sea creatures, or the bones of vertebrates, or the woody tissues of plants. These are more likely to survive because they're hardier, right? They don't decay easily, they are quite strong generally, and this means that they have what we call a higher preservation potential. There's more chance that they will preserve as fossils. And I wouldn't like you to go away from this thinking that they are not useful. Actually, these hard parts can tell us an awful lot about the biology of a fossil when it was alive. So, for example, if we study the shape of hard parts, that can hint at their functional. This is an entire field called functional morphology. And indeed, soft parts can leave their marks on hard parts. Um, a one example we'll be seeing over the course of this series of lectures is that mollusk shells have scars that show the location of muscles, and we can use those to understand their musculature, for example, or their mode of life. So the bottom line is that plants and animals incorporate numerous different types of hard parts and use them for a variety of reasons. What these hard parts are is actually shown on this table that I've created for you on the right hand side here. And I split it into kind of two camps, which I hope will be a useful way of thinking about it. The first are inorganic hard parts. These are generally mineralized and they include calcium carbonate, silica, and phosphates. We often refer to this kind of um, a hard part as a form of biomineralization, so um, making use of minerals in a biological context. To quickly whiz through those, um, carbonates, particularly calcium carbonate, is quite common and is found in, for example, corals, bryozoans, brachiopods, moss, mollusks, many arthropods, and echinoderms. Silica, so that's silicon dioxide, is a bit uh, rarer, I guess it's fair to say, but it forms the skeletons of most sponges. Phosphate, uh, usually in the form of fluoroapatite, so CaPO4, is typical of vertebrate bone, our hard bits, um, are made of calcium uh, fluoroapatite. And organic hard tissues are kind of the other camp that we may want to consider. So these uh, do exist. Uh, by organic, I mean something that is made up of calcium, oxygen, and hydrogen rather than being uh, mineralized per se. And in plants, those include um, large compounds like lignin, that's used to make wood hard, and wood is quite hard, hence it being a good building material. Cellulose to provide a, a structural integrity, and a really cool thing called sporopollenin. This is used in the reproductive um, structures of many plants and is really, really tough. Uh, equivalents to these in animals include chitin. This is kind of the uh, organic hard bit that arthropods make their exoskeletons out of. And in vertebrates, connective tissues including collagen uh, and keratin, so the stuff that our fingernails and hair is made of. So those are organic hard tissues. So that's a quick overview of the hard tissues that we find in the natural world. Now, taphonomy itself includes a range of processes that occur after the death of an animal, but before, um, or as part of, I guess, fossilization. Sorry about that, my computer is giving me a warning. There we go. As mentioned, it's unlikely that any given organism will end up as a fossil. If it does, there are several stages that normally occur in the transition from a dead body to a fossil. These are shown on the diagram here. They include 
decay and scavenging of the soft parts of the animal. Um, so that happens almost all the time, as you can see. If something is bowed immediately, we may not, we may manage to avoid that, and we'll be covering these instances in our work on exceptional preservation in just a minute. But then once you've had decay, you will often have transport, and this will lead often to the breakage of heart tissues. We'll visit this just towards the end of this video. You can then find burial and often modification of the hard tissues. Sometimes they are preserved unaltered, but often they'll be either recrystallized. Material may be removed and create, for example, a cast of what was there, or if that's filled with another material, a mold showing uh, the space that has been removed, or we can add material. So we can mineralize uh, the fossils or fill them, fill voids with sediment, for example. So those are all of the processes that kind of are part of this science of taxonomy. And I'm going to go through some of the more important ones in a bit more detail now. And I'm going to start with this, um, uh, this uh, kind of process by which soft tissues become uh, less uh, useful to us, which is decay. So in terms of decay, decay is a key step. It starts immediately after death and it destroys the soft tissues, right? And that kind of makes sense. That's, I think, is inherently uh, fairly uh, clear. We're, we're used to kind of the idea that th things, once they're dead, no longer metabolize, therefore they start to decay. Um, this results in many elements of an organism's morphology being lost. So on this example, example, you can see that this decaying Halloween pumpkin is starting to lose uh, some of the features that were carved into it, or at least they're changing shape and will eventually disappear. And this is typically driven by other organisms. A corpse is a, a valuable source of food for many creatures. If these, these creatures that make use of a corpse are really big, we call that scavenging. If they are microbes, we call that decay. But both of those I think are, are included in taphonomy under this particular heading. So the things that destroy the soft tissues, uh, be they big or small, uh, matter at this point. In terms of actual decay though, though that which is reliant on microbes, the biggest controlling factor in the decay of organisms is oxygen. So in oxygen rich environments, microbes break down organic carbon by converting carbon and oxygen to carbon dioxide and water. It's how they make their living, right? Um, in the absence of oxygen, it doesn't mean generally that decay completely stops, but things like uh, nitrate, man manganese dioxide, iron oxide, or sulfate can allow decay to occur via different chemical pathways, but this occurs more slowly. Indeed, within any given um, rotting creature, there will often be uh, areas or zones which have very little oxygen. So after oxygen, the next biggest controls on decay are temperature and the pH. These may work as you may kind of expect. So high temperature promotes rapid decay. Things don't last long in hot environments, whereas in cold environments, they will last a lot longer. Extremes of pH, i.e. either very acidic or very alkali, will slow decay. A nice example of this is peat swamps, which is acidic. So if you think of um, kind of the archeological bog bodies that every now, now and then people find, this is because they're found in acidic environments which kind of tan the skin and help preserve it. The exact nature of decay also depends on the organic carbon that we're talking about. As we've already highlighted, some organic compounds are very decay resistant. Uh, chitin, that bit that articles make their exoskeletons out of, is a nice example. They can survive, or chitin can survive pretty much anything and has been found in the fossil record back to hundreds of millions of years ago. But other um, soft parts are very prone to decay. We call these tissues labile, just means they decay very easily. So all of this means that decay occurs in a non-random way within any given organism. Some tissues di disappear faster than others. And that can actually have implications for us when we study fossils. For example, if we put fossils into an evolutionary framework, the order in which decay occurs can um, make highly decayed organisms 
look like they're more closely related to their ancestors um, in a thing called stemward slippage. But that doesn't really matter. Just know that um, this is a non-random bias that occurs. So I've already highlighted that um, at times exceptional preservation occurs and sites of exceptional preservation um, provide unique insights into past ecosystems. Excep exceptional preservation in and of itself is, for example, the preservation of the soft tissues that normally decay. Uh, this is a very rare state and we've already covered that tissues decay in a sequence dependent on volatile content. But the reason that we have exceptional preservation is that decay can be halted by polymerization of organic molecules or by mineralization. So in general, uh, we can think of fossilization as a rate between the rate, sorry, a rate, a race between the rate of decay and the rate of pre-burial mineralization. So it's a balance between these two that defines the state of preservation of a fossil. Often, as I've already alluded to, um, you get exceptional preservation in entire layers of rock or sites. And these fossil bearing formations are termed Lagerstätten. It's a uh, German word for meaning place of storage. Um, so Lagerstätten is the plural, Lagerstätte is the um, singular. I've put a definition on the slide for you here, um, in case it's useful, a sedimentary deposit that is of, of value because of the fossils it contains. Um, so this also highlights this definition that a fossil Lagerstätte um, can come in two forms. So it can either contain an abundance of fossils, an accumulation, and this is called a concentration Lagerstätte, or it can uh, be a kind of layer of rock where fossils are ex exceptionally preserved, and this is a conservation Lagerstätte. So fossil assemblages via concentration are generally the gathering of remains by processes of sedimentary transport and sorting, and they lead to fossil packed horizons uh, like shell beds, which we um, have in the UK. For example, there's a very famous one down in Dorset. This doesn't really lend itself towards exceptional preservation. So we're not gonna talk much more about it here, but they, those beds can be quite useful as marker beds to allow us to, um, to uh, uh, work out how rocks relate to each other in different areas. Conservation, Lagerstätte, in fossilization is um, based on uh, normally processes that avoid or limit scavenging or decay and diagenetic destruction. I've put a uh, image on the slide here which shows examples of way, where we may found these. Um, and these include in sedimentary uh, regimes, such as marine, so in the sea, lacustrine associated with the lake, um, and often uh, sites of exceptional preservation uh, associated with those two watery environments um, include stagnant and often anoxic waters that lends itself towards exceptional preservation. Oh, that's a good cup of joe. So the other places we may expect exceptional preservation are those where sedimentation rates are so rapid that carcasses are buried essentially in uh, essentially instantly. Examples of this include uh, rapidly migrating river channels, delta fronts, or other places where you get mass flows of sediment, so storm beds or turbidites in the oceans. And those can bury um, organisms very, very quickly before decay uh, messes up their fossilization potential, or messes up their level of preservation, I suppose I should say. Other examples included on this slide include amber. This is resin that oozes through tree bark and may trap insects and occasionally vertebrates and then fossilizes. Or for example, tar, and, um, tar pits and peat beds, peat bogs, into which organisms fall and are then preserved. And so you can see that these extend all of the way from um, terrestrial, so land-based environments, all of the way through to the deep sea. And there are many different taphonomic windows. These are kind of uh, situations where we get certain types of preservation, which lend themselves towards exceptional preservation. So that's exceptional preservation in terms of the sites that we find fossils. But I wanted to quickly highlight 
that one key way in which exceptionally preserved fossils are preserved is through mineralization of the soft tissues. There is loads of work that's been done on how this happens and what it actually means, which I can't summarize here, but I wanted to highlight with this slide that mineralization can occur through replacement with pyrite, phosphate, or carbonate, for example, amongst other minerals. This typically occurs after burial, so it's a diagenetic process, it's a form of diagenesis. And factors that lend themselves towards each type of mineral are shown on this diagram here. Um, overall, it depends on the, the, or the form of mineralization depends on the nature of the original tissue, the rate of burial, the organic content, and the salinity. And so, for example, you can see based on this diagram that if we have high organic content but low rate of burial, we're, we may well see phosphatization. If, however, with high organic content, we have a high rate of burial, we can often preserve soft parts in a form of carbonate, be that calcium carbonate or another carbonate. And low organic content and high rates of burial lend themselves towards pyritization. So that's what this diagram is showing you. So that is exceptional preservation through mineralization. A quick addendum to that is that very recent work, including work that's conducted here at Manchester that I'll speak about in just a second, has shown that the chemistry, um, so this has been work studying the chemistry of fossils and it's demonstrated that surprising amounts of the original materials can survive in some organisms. So DNA, a la Jurassic Park, is on the more labile end of the spectrum. It's more likely to, um, to uh, be destroyed in over short periods of time. And the oldest is less than a million years. So if you really like Jurassic Park, I'm afraid that's fairly unlikely to happen. However, other biomolecules, so uh, um, biological molecules that organisms use to build their, themselves, can preserve for quite a lot longer. So the example that's shown here is some work that was published in 2011 by a team here at the University of Manchester, which was looking at the chemistry of fossils. And this is a, a bird called Confucius Sanctus. sanctus. Um, you can see the fossil here on the left. And shown right next to it <clears throat> is a chemical map of the surface of that rock. Um, in particular, what's shown here in red is copper. So these are concentrations in copper in some but not all of the feathers of this bird. So you can see there are wing feathers that go down here, um, which aren't picked out in this copper. And that's because the copper that we can see here was bound into a pigment, a pigment called melanin. The kind of, this is the pigment that animals use to make, for example, um, hair and skin darker. Um, and so what this means is that we could use this uh, the remnants of this copper as a indicator of where melanin was in this bird and thus reconstruct its color, which you can see on the bottom right here. So this is one example of when, where in the last 10 or 15 years we've discovered that actually quite a few biological molecules can survive for tens of millions of years without being radically altered. And that's an active research area here at the University of Manchester. And I wanted to finish this by highlighting what can happen to those remaining hard parts in a, in a normal situation, i.e. not one with exceptional preservation, prior to their preservation as fossils. <clears throat> so it may be that the remaining hard parts can be simply buried where they rotted. However, a lot of the time they'll be broken up and they'll be transported to the place of deposition. On this slide, we can see processes by which these uh, breakage and damage occurs. Some are physical and some are chemical. So um, hard bits can be fragmented. Individual shells, bones, or pieces of woody tissue, for example, can be broken up into smaller pieces. This could be by, for example, scavengers or wave action. Uh, they can be abraded, so they can be washed against each other in, for example, uh, as you see in shells on a beach, grinding or polishing against each other and thus becoming rounded. If you have a uh, organism with hard parts that are held together by less hard parts, um, as rotting and decay occurs, you can have disarticulation. 
So an organism is broken up into its component bits as connective tissue is removed. We can also expect to see in some instances bioerosion. So this is the removal of skeletal materials by boring organisms such as sponges, algae, and bivalves. Like there's a whole ecosystem associated with um, uh, dead whales in the oceans when these sink that, can act that include a number of organisms that can eat their bones. Uh, so the other one that I've missed out here is corrosion and dissolution. This is the, uh, a chemical reaction that can occur um, removing uh, bits of our fossil depending on the environment in which they're buried. When fossils are, or hard parts are buried, they are often also altered. This most commonly occurs through flattening as shown here. So as the um, layers of sediment flatten, thanks to the weight of sediment above them, that will often include flattening the fossils within those layers. But also within diagenesis, you can get the conversion of um, one mineral to another. So a, a very common one that we see over the four course of diagenesis is that aragonite shells, which are a tiny bit less stable, can transform into calcite. So those are, that's a collection of things that can happen to the hard parts of an organism once it has died and of course rotted. And that brings us to the end of this particular video. Just below it, I've put some examples of some 3D models showing different kinds of preservation. And I would encourage you to have a look at those and have a think about um, how those will alter our picture of past ecosystems and our understanding of the animals in question. After that, there'll be a quiz on the blackboard that you can pass to unlock an achievement for this particular um, chunk of your content. And then you can move on to the next video um, that's um, the second, the equivalent of the second lecture in this course, and that's based on trilobites. So I hope this has been interesting. I hope trilobites are interesting. I really like trilobites. Trilobites are cool. And I'll see you soon.